long time. Huh? So just a little disclaimer. I was blessed just to be part of the worship this morning, just to see so many different men sharing different styles, different messages, but all the same central focus. And uh, <clears throat> back to the gospel. And the message that I share today as we talked about disciplining ourselves for the purpose of godliness can be twisted as being self-righteous, but I want us to go back to the gospel. It's all because of the fact that as Chris brought out starting worship, um, it's abiding in Christ, it's reflecting him. Um, last Sunday, I was playing <clears throat> tennis with Josiah over in Elma, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing reasonably good for a 64-year-old, but all of a sudden, I'm laying on the ground, um, and I'm not sure what caused me to fall, but boom, <laughs> and <clears throat> a picture of mankind, right? Um, there's that precious second where I'm losing my balance and this is not going to feel good. Um, likewise, spiritually speaking, we, we lose our balance and uh, we crash and crash and burn on believers. It's a lifetime thing. Believers, it happens now and then. We pick ourselves back up and by God's grace, move on as we abide in him. So, so back to the gospel is, is a good theme. Um, so we'll be focusing on Proverbs 13 today, Proverbs 13, 4 in particular. Um, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. The soul of the diligent is satisfied. <clears throat> the owners of a home not too far from here have done a great job of demonstrating how not to landscape a yard. They have a large yard, and uh, this was a big project, took much of the summer. They uh, covered <clears throat> the areas with black plastic or fabric and then they covered that with loads of large crushed rock and there are several or more sections and they're fairly big sections uh, maybe 15 feet by 40 to 50 feet so they're not there it's not one little corner it's big sections and uh, <clears throat> a lot of landscaping fabric a lot of rock a lot of work a lot of expense as i ran past that yard recently i could not help but not admire the fact that the entire area they worked on has a wide assortment of weeds, um, very thickly covered, not just one or two, but solid weeds, <laughs> and um, knee high. It, it, actually, it, it looks terrible. Um, <clears throat> so their, their project did not turn out too well. I'm not sure what happened. If they used the wrong fabric under the rock or some, something didn't, didn't go well. Maybe it's too large a rocks to really fill in the, the space, spaces to keep the weeds down, whatever. But um, it uh, did not turn out well. And that yard is an illustration of that verse that we'll focus on, Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of slugger craves, it craves, but gets nothing. So the diligent is satisfied. <laughs> the homeowners were craving a nicely landscaped yard, or they never would have spent that much time, that much money, that much energy um, landscaping it. So again, either they did not have the knowledge to do it right, or they didn't follow through on some things. I'm not sure, it doesn't matter, but um, it uh, did not turn out well. <clears throat> so sp spiritually speaking, we need to uh, have more than a craving for spiritual things. We need to have a grasp of truth and I think Johnny shared near this area in Romans chapter 10 this morning. Um, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. They have a craving, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So in other words, like the homeowners that ended up with spiritual weeds, um, as we consider in a few minutes, we have to have that grasp of truth, but we also need to apply that truth. So if we could just open in prayer, we thank you, Father, for your truth, your, your word, your guidance in a world that is full of weeds, full of sin, full of darkness, full of chaos, full of, full of problems, full of hurt, and our own hearts can be deceitful at times in that same way. Thank you for your word just to guide us, direct us, and help us to be diligent in, in following that 
not to earn your love, but because we are loved. We love because you first loved us and help us to live life that way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as you may recall, several weeks ago, we focused on Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but um, those who act faithfully are his delight. And while we'll not focus on the topic of truthfulness today, as we read Proverbs 13, notice the continued theme, the continued thought process on truthfulness and lies and, and synonyms, other words that are like that. We'll read the whole chapter, Proverbs 13, but again, we're going to focus on Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4, and the topic of being a sluggard or being slothful versus being diligent or being disciplined. So as I read Proverbs 13, we're not going to, we can't possibly get to cover every verse. We'd be here till sunset, <clears throat> but uh, try to focus on each verse as we go through it and what life situations they might bring to mind in your life as I, as I read through Proverbs chapter 13. So Proverbs chapter 13, <clears throat> a wise son accept his, accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. From the fruit of a man's mouth, he enjoys good, but the desire of the treacherous is violence. The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat or made satisfied or different versions have richly supplied and various things along that line. <clears throat> a righteous man hates falsehood but a wicked man acts disgustingly and shamefully. Righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts the sinner. There is one who pretends to be rich, but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, but has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but the poor hears no rebuke. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked goes out. Through insolence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfill fulfilled is as a tree of life. The one who despises the word will be in debt to it, but the one who fears the commandments will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to, to turn aside from the snares of death. Good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool displays folly. A wicked messenger falls into adversity but a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof will be honored. Desire realizes sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to turn away from evil. He who walks with the wise, <coughs> with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm, or as we know, if you hang around with bozos, you will become a bozo. Adversity pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. A good man leaves inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Abundant food is in the fallow ground of the poor, but it is swept away by injustice. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. So again, we'll focus on Proverbs 13, 4. And as you probably know, I like to have a take home word for the day and you can use whatever you want, but my suggestion is gonna be the word diligent or diligence. Um, diligence flowing out of one's relationship with Jesus. Again, not to earn in self-righteousness, but flowing out of our relationship with the Lord and being diligent. 
diligence flowing out of one's relationship with Jesus being the, the vaccine for being a self-centered sluggard wrapped up in self. So we'll encounter quite a few verses with the word or the concept of diligence. And we'll just look at just a few now. Turning back to Proverbs chapter six for just a minute, if you could. We'll look at a few verses there, Proverbs chapter six. And starting with verse six. Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her, her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, old sluggard, when we rise up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands. Your poverty will come <clears throat> in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Different things we talk about today can certainly be applied and maybe are primarily applied to physical things, but can also be applied to spiritual concepts. You don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 15, 32 says, he who neglects discipline or correction despises himself. So this person, when given godly advice, this person says, who cares? What's the difference? Or leave me alone, I'm all wrapped up in myself. Proverbs 18, nine, um, you could turn to there for just a second, Proverbs 18, nine. He who is slack in his work or he who's not diligent is a brother to him who destroys. That's, that's an interesting verse. Um, if we're slothful, if we're indifferent, we're, if we're apathetic, be it physical things, be it spiritual things, we are a brother to the one who destroys. And who is the one who destroys? Well, you know the answer. Um, <clears throat> So some things that uh, kill are obvious. A missile is an obvious lethal weapon. I mean, it's, it, you can't miss it. Murder is an obvious lethal weapon. A gun is an obvious lethal weapon. Proverbs 632 that we looked at some times back talks about the obvious lethal spiritual weapon of adultery. He who commits adultery is a fool. He who destroy himself does it. James 3, 6 talks about another obvious lethal weapon, um, the tongue. The tongue is on fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. So the wages of sin is death. Many sins are, are glaring, they're obvious, they're out there, they're easy to see. <clears throat> the damaging and deadly results of these sins are often immediately obvious and damaging, deadly. But what I wanna focus on today is the, the subtle sins, the ones that maybe aren't quite so obvious, but in the end are just as damaging, just as deadly. We might call these silent, killers, sins of omission versus sins of commission, sins of not doing something we should have done versus doing things we should not have done. So sins of omission may, be not, may, not, may not be as glaring, may not involve that obvious sinful action, the consequences of passive sin, may not be immediately obvious, but ultimately the results will be damaging and deadly. James 4.17 says that, uh, now to one who knows what is right to do, but does not do it, to him it is sin. And we need to be careful of uh, not using excuses. I didn't know, or I wasn't aware that what I was doing was sin. Ignorance is typically not an excuse. In most cases, if we're reading God's word, if we are sensitive to the leading of his spirit, if we truly listen to godly counsel, seek godly counsel, as it says elsewhere in Proverbs, if we listen to our conscience, conscience, we will know what is right to do. 
but will we choose to do it? So again, we must recognize that the, and be aware of the fact that sins of omission are as destructive ultimately as sins of commission. What we don't do is what that we should be doing is just as destructive as those things that perhaps we do. So Proverbs 13, four, the soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing. Gets, gets what? Gets nothing, nothing. Nothing is a, a vacuum. Nothing will suck in the garbage and the sin that's all around us. Think of it as a vacuum, nothing. It's not neutral. Nothing is damaging. Nothing is ultimately deadly. Notice in verse four, there's a spark of life. There's a spark of motivation. The soul of the sluggard does what? The soul of the sluggard craves. There's a restlessness. There's a, a, there's a sense of desire. Something's missing. In the physical realm, we get, we get hungry and we crave physical food. Um, typically after second hour, I'm starved and I need to get home and eat as fast as I can. So I, I, I crave and we probably all have that feeling at some point or another. We crave. If we don't eat, we get nothing. <clears throat> Spiritually speaking, the same is true, right? Um, to, the slugger craves but gets nothing. Um, in the spiritual realm, people may try to deny it, that they're craving, that they need something spiritually, but there's a vacuum there. There's an emptiness there without the Lord. People will try to ignore that. People will try to attack that, but we all crave spiritual food. Proverbs 3.11 says that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. So there's a craving there. Romans 1.20, we're told that creation reveals the creator and that man's without an excuse. So people have a craving, a, a need, a desire, a hunger for a relationship with God, but the sluggard, the slothful, the indifferent, just keep drifting along, perhaps in some form of idolatry, as they seek to fulfill that vacuum, but uh, and in the end, get nothing. Um, as believers, we might crave to grow in our relationship with the Lord and with others, but that craving must be converted in action. As James chapter one reminds us, if we're not doers of the word, we, we do what? We delude ourselves, we deceive ourselves. It has to be put into action. In a book similar to Pilgrim's Progress, an allegory called The Night of the Splendid Way by W.E. Cool. Um, <clears throat> the, the knight of that book who's on a journey encounters many dangerous places, many evil places, many wicked places, but he comes to a place called the City of Good Intentions. And he's told that is the most dangerous place that there is of every place you will be because the good intentions will make you feel calm, will all you to sleep, everything's fine, but they'll always remain just good intentions unless they're, they're actively acted upon and carried out. So as it says in James, to him who knows what to do and doesn't do it, um, to him it is sin. <clears throat> the end result of being a sluggard what is, is nothing. It's a vacuum, it's darkness, it's emptiness. Depression, misery, disillusionment. The end result is nothing. It's despair. A sluggard, a slothful person marinates their lives in, in selfishness and various forms of idols, trying to find meaning in life, trying to find purpose in life, trying to find a reason for life. Various forms of pride, including self-pity. Instead of focusing on Jesus, instead of focusing on and regarding others as more important than themselves, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, the sluggard often is immersed in me and myself and I. Whatever is comfortable for the moment, how can I please myself? What's the path of least resistance? Um, so in the midst of uh, emptiness and despair and disillusionment, the sluggard can look in the mirror and see the problem um, themselves, me, myself, and I. 
When it comes to physical matters such as food, if we're sluggard, if we're slothful, we're indifferent, if we won't work, we will starve. We will fall before a silent killer. When it comes to spiritual matters, if we're a sluggard, if we're slothful, if we're indifferent, if we do not fix our eyes on Jesus, we will starve, we will fall before a silent killer. Not, not immediately, not as obviously, but it will happen. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's not earning our righteousness, it's because we, are, we belong to him, we, we love because he first loved us. In the physical world, silent killers are all around us. And just kind of think in your own mind as I go through a few, what, what, what are some silent killers that you can think of in the physical world? Um, I remember having a guy at our house looking at a tree that kind of hangs over our house. <coughs> Excuse me. And he looked up at a limb and he said, it was a big dead limb, probably weighed a few hundred pounds. That is what I call a widow maker. Um, <laughs> danger, silent, quiet, but the potential was there. Um, lead and old paint, silent, deadly killer. Asbestos in old buildings, silent, deadly killers. Um, and again, try to, try to be thinking of one or two more in your own mind. Old, frayed electrical wiring in a house that can start a serious fire, silent, deadly killer a patch of ice on the sidewalk that you didn't see can change your life forever right <clears throat> can be a silent deadly killer or damaging at least so if we're negligent in attending to that dead limb if we're negligent in attending to the old paint if we're negligent in attending to the asbestos or the wiring or the patch of ice Sooner or later, there will be consequences. Um, it's going to happen. Any of these passive, silent killers can be as deadly as an obvious active weapon. Over the decades, I've hired <clears throat> several hundred people working with Great River Homes, did, did many more interviews than that. And the human resources person would always tell me now, Jerry, you can't look at their personal lives, just focus on their job skills. Just don't, don't take into account their personal lives. But I found I could not separate the two. <laughs> you, you just can't do it. Um, if uh, during the interview, I picked up on the fact that the person is very unstable or they have chronically unstable relationships or chronic high stress, I pretty well knew that that person would not be showing up for work. I pretty well knew that that person could not be investing in others working at a group home setting because they, they had nothing left in themselves. So I didn't necessarily say it, but you know, we just kind of moved on to somebody else. Um, <clears throat> now I doubt if the, any of these applicants who were chronically unstable, chronically stressed, do the choices. I doubt very much if one day they did this. They got out their planner, they put it at, sitting at the breakfast table, having breakfast and said, my goal, I have a goal for my life. This is my goal. I have a goal. I'm going to make this happen. I am going to make a mess out of my life. That's it. I got it. That's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that before? I'm going to shroud my life in chaos. I'm going to shroud my life in darkness. I'm going to just fill my life with a void of nothingness. I got it. Oh, finally. Why didn't I think of that before? How many people do that? Yeah, we don't do that, right? We don't do that. People don't plan nothingness. But the natural tendency, apart from Jesus, apart from the energizing presence of the Holy Spirit, is to drift into nothingness. People are often not aware of the fact that they're drifting into nothingness. Often it is silent, subtle, obscure, like that big limb hanging over the house. Um, a slow process associated with being a sluggard, associated with being slothful, being apathetic, which ultimately, certainly, 
leads to chaos and darkness. Often as I listen between the lines of what some applicants at, at work were telling me, I could see the, the signs of the silent killers, <clears throat> the, um, the little choices, the little sinful actions that they made throughout life that they would, didn't have to share with me, but they were sharing with me because I just stayed there and listened. Um, and I could see the signs, the gradual spiral and slowly, certainly descending, spiraling downwards, <clears throat> silent, but deadly. So to all of us, but perhaps especially to the younger people, I would say beware of the seemingly harmless drift. Beware of becoming complacent. Beware of becoming slothful in your quiet time with the Lord and making sure that that quiet time happens. <clears throat> Beware of making excuses. Beware of making excuses for not going to a Bible study or beware of idols like popularity or excessive pleasure or work or material things. Beware of becoming lukewarm in your relationship with the Lord, slowly, gradually, subtly, and all of a sudden we're in a place of chaos, we're in a place of darkness, we're in a place of nothingness. <clears throat> now, and I would, I would emphasize that word now, I would, I would shout it out, but you'd all jump. Now is the time to build that house on rock, right? Not sand before the storms come, because the storms will come <clears throat> in one form or another. The first couple of verses <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 12 tells us to lay aside every encumbrance, every weight, which so easily entangles us. <clears throat> A meaningful hobby is healthy. It's essential. It's good for our health. It's important to have them. But again, we can lose our balance. A hobby can become a morally, morally neutral hobby can become an idol. <clears throat> and uh, we have to balance that out. If it starts to choke out our quiet time with the Lord, if it starts to choke out investing in relationship with other people. So finding that balance is important. <clears throat> also, this, this is so basic, but it's not rocket science, right? <clears throat> if you hang around with gozos, you know, it's going to happen. You will become a bozo. Um, <clears throat> So as we look at guarding ourselves against being a slugger, being slothful, being indifferent, the people we hang around with, people we spend time with will, will influence that. So knowing that the silent spiritual killer is associated with being a sluggard, with being slothful are all around us, what are we to do? What's our response to that? We're to be diligent, we're to be disciplined. First Timothy four, seven and eight, <clears throat> tells us to have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself, discipline yourself for godliness. <clears throat> for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is, in value in, is of value in every way as it holds promise for this present life as well as for the life to come. So being diligent and disciplining ourselves, training ourselves, again, not to earn God's favor, but because we are the Lord's. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to be diligent to present yourself to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. 2 Peter 3.14, God tells us to be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. The last half of today's verse, Proverbs 13.4, again uses that word diligent. The soul of the diligent is satisfied. What's that word diligent mean? To be conscientious, to be earnest, to be steady, to be faithful. Fill in one more word in your own mind. What does that word diligent mean to you? <clears throat> or to be diligent. And notice as I go through a few more verses on diligence and being diligent, a sense of urgency that's, that are in these verses. Um, a while back, we looked at Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the streams of life. One way we need to watch over our heart 
is uh, found in the next verse I'm going to share about a very common, very prolific, very toxic, but silent killer. And I, every year or so I bring this topic up because I think it needs to be brought up because I see it in my own life and I see it in the world around us. I see it everywhere. Um, <clears throat> uh, Hebrews 12, 15, see to it or be diligent that no one comes short of the grace of God. And what comes next? That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. And by many, and by it, many are defiled. When it comes to death and destruction, bitterness is much more of a factor to fear than COVID. I really believe that's true. Um, COVID might harm us physically. Bitterness as capable of spreading as COVID defiles us, harms us spiritually. Whether we know it or not, probably all of us have been exposed to COVID. Many of us have had it. And we've probably all been exposed to it. Likewise, I strongly suspect that everyone here has, is, and will be exposed to things that can make us bitter. It's going to happen. Every one of us has been sinned against and will be sinned against coming up. Um, it's going to happen. A self-centered sluggard is perfect soil for bitterness to grow, to expand, to proliferate. We may be diligent in using hand sanitizer as working against COVID. <clears throat> we need to be just as diligent using God's word as a sanitizer regarding bitterness. Notice that sense of urgency in Hebrews 12, 15, as I read it again. And notice that the verse is applied to all of us without exception. See to it, be diligent, that no one, that doesn't leave you out, um, no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it, many are defiled. Walking on a trail recently in Whitewater State Park, Linda and I noted how many roots there were on and next to the trail, how many different kinds of roots there were, and it's just kind of an interesting little observation that we went through. Draw the parallel. There, there's roots of bitterness and various kinds of roots of bitterness all around us. Um, the more subtle, the more obvious, different causes, different, different people are affected different ways by things, <clears throat> all kinds of the roots of bitterness around us. The antidote for bitterness, back to the gospel, right? <clears throat> um, back to the Lord, back to forgiveness, or as it says in the first part of Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. So moving on, what else are we to, to do to avoid being a sluggard, to avoid being slothful, to, to avoid being indifferent? Galatians 6, 9, God tells us to persevere, do not grow weary in doing good, be diligent. James 1, 12, blesses the man who remains steadfast or diligent under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love. So again, be diligent. As Johnny shared a couple of weeks ago, prove yourselves doers of the word, be diligent. <clears throat> Second Peter 5, 1 through 7, notice how the concept of diligence and steadfastness is kind of woven through these verses. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. For this very reason, make every effort or be diligent to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness or diligence and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brother, brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Romans chapter 12, verse two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, testing, <coughs> and by testing you may discern what the will of God is perfect and acceptable, or be diligent. If we're a spiritual sluggard, if we're slothful, if we're indifferent, we will inevitably be chiseled by the world to fit the world's mold. It'll, it'll just happen because the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. So that creates the vacuum and something's gonna fill that vacuum. Um, 
at work, whatever we do, Colossians 3.23, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, be diligent. I was, some of you know Mark Albertson a little bit, I'll just share. <clears throat> He's a person, person led me to the Lord, he attended the chapel here 35, 40 years ago, <clears throat> lives in Tucson now. But he was sharing a story at, uh, when he was working at Lakeside and he had been, Mark had been a Christian for a year or so and he didn't really openly preach witness to this person, but he, he shared, I'm going to Emmaus Bible College and I love the Lord and that kind of stuff. And, after a few few weeks, and uh, the person came up to Mark during break time and just shared with Mark, I want God to be to me what he is to you. Oh, so obviously he set an example at work by what he did and what he said. So <clears throat> whatever we do, work heartily as for the Lord, be diligent. Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things above, not on the things of earth, be diligent. And Philippians 4.13 maybe summarizes the whole picture on the general theme of not being a sluggard, not being slothful, not being indifferent. I press on, I press on toward the goal, the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. So we need to press on toward that goal, the prize of the upper call of God in Jesus, because the silent killers are all around us. And if we're not growing in the Lord, the silent killers are moving in. It's, a, it's just a fact. And we begin to die. We begin to drift. We begin to, to spiral downwards. So <clears throat> be diligent. Um, in reference to our generally sedentary modern American lifestyle, You've, some of you've probably heard, some of you have probably heard this one. Someone recently coined the phrase that sitting is the new smoking, and um, <clears throat> the idea being being sedentary all the time, watching TV for three or four hours, being on the computer for three or four hours, we're not getting any activity. Those are the kinds of things that will lead to obesity, that will lead to blood pressure issues, and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> now, obviously. It's not really proven that sitting is that dangerous, but it, it does set you up for that kind of stuff, whether it's physically or spiritually, you're passively sitting, passively just letting life go by. <clears throat> Silent killers. It occurred to me as I was thinking through Proverbs 13, 4, that in a sense, being a sluggard, being slothful, being indifferent, being apathetic, are forms of exhaust, a waste product of selfishness just wrapped up in ourselves contrary to philippians chapter 2 where we're told to be humble we're told to regard others as more important than ourselves have that same attitude as in christ jesus um, <clears throat> a sluggard is wrapped up in themselves as i think about another product of exhaust um, carbon monoxide that, that's deadly quiet silent killer um, odorless, tasteless. When people are exposed to carbon monoxide, the carbon monoxide displaces the oxygen, so the oxygen can't be absorbed, and you can draw the spiritual analogy. When we're <clears throat> filled with the world, we're filled with Satan, we're filled with self, we're deceived, truth is displaced. Um, so for spiritual sluggards, the flesh, the world, Satan will replace the oxygen of truth. So keep the word diligent in mind as I close with two applications. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 comes to mind. Let us consider how to stimulate or how to spur one another to love and good deeds. God's aware that we can, believers can be passive. Believers can be spiritually sitting. Believers can be have their truth displaced by error. <clears throat> God tells us to consider or to study, to contemplate <clears throat> how we can spur one another to action. We need that body ministry. We need each other, right? <clears throat> like a horse that won't move at times, we need to be spurred. Or some versions of the Bible translated as to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. 
I've never ridden a horse in my life, and I probably never will ride a horse in my life at this age, especially considering what happened in tennis last Sunday. Um, so I don't know a whole lot about horses. Um, that being the case, I had the impression that a spur, using a spur when riding a horse was something like uh, using a whip using pain to control the actions of the horse. But just out of curiosity, I did some reading <clears throat> and I assume it's accurate that the spurs, the opposite is actually true. So what I'm about to say about the relationship between the rider and the horse and the use of spurs, I'll just use the, the analogy and apply it to spiritual things. <clears throat> With an experienced rider who knows the horse and the horse knows the rider, use of a spur is a very gentle, very subtle action, hardly even noticeable. Um, just a, a gentle nudge, just, just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> it's not a whip. Like the rider of a horse, if we're the one giving advice, what are we supposed to do if we spur one another? It's, it's gentle. It's based on a relationship. It's, it's not a whip. Um, there might be a case for that here and there, but <clears throat> generally speaking, it's gentle. And if we're the person receiving the guidance, the stimulation, we need to be what? We need to be responsive to it. <clears throat> we need to listen to it. Conversely, if you think about it, a self-centered sluggard will tend to be a bull in the china shop, right? By what they say or how they respond. Um, so Christians need to spur or stimulate one another and then be responsive when somebody else is reaching out to us. It's an antidote for being a sluggard, an antidote for being slothful. So, and the last thought that I would share is while not using the word diligent, an author by the name of Sarah Young captures the concept of that balance between being God between godly diligence and trust while avoiding being a um, vacuum created by a sluggard. So what she writes is written as if Jesus was speaking. So just keep that in mind. So as if Jesus was speaking, it says, let me show you my way for this day. I will guide you continually <clears throat> so that you can relax and enjoy my presence in the present. Living well is both a discipline and an art. Concentrate on staying close to me, the divine artist. Discipline your thoughts to trust in me as I work my ways in your life. Pray about everything, then leave outcomes up to me. Do not fear my will, for through it I will accomplish what is best for you. Take a deep breath, and dive into the depths of absolute trust in me. Underneath are the everlasting arms. So I thought that's just a good summary of walking with the Lord, walking in fellowship with him, being motivated by that, and avoiding being a sluggard, being slothful, being indifferent to spiritual things. <clears throat> so in closing, a paraphrase, this is a major paraphrase <clears throat> of Proverbs 13, 4, could be, Beware of the silent killers. Take care of your spiritual landscape. Buy truth and don't sell it. Discipline yourself, not to exalt yourself, but discipline yourself for godliness. Press on toward the goal, <clears throat> the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So to, to be diligent. Um, I can, we can close in prayer. Just thank you, Father, for... Oh, worship this morning, I think of that uh, thought that was brought out that you were willing to go to the cross. And we just thank you for that proof of your love and help us to absorb that, <clears throat> to reflect on that, to draw near to you, knowing that you will draw near to us. And then help us to turn around and reflect that to the world, to each other, to be diligent in doing so out of love for you, not out of hypocrisy or 
trying to impress others, but simply out of love for you to, to be diligent and following you. I pray for that and help us to remember that word or some other message, some other thought from today's message throughout the week that we might make a difference in a world that is, is chaotic and dark and void. I pray for that. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.